Good to see everybody here at lunch. We're going to have a, a very active and engaging uh, a lunch session uh, for you here today. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, first, we have uh, with us from HIP Investor, Paul Herman. So please welcome Paul. <laughs> HIP Investor is a, uh, a unique resource for understanding how companies go about doing their business. And uh, some of the measures that are, that are used by HIP Investor are positive impact of products, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, use of energy, uh, diversity and positive management practices. And I was talking to Paul about this before, uh, before this event, and we were talking about how do you measure a good company? How can someone who's looking for an, a prospective employer understand what employers are doing and how innovative they are? And uh, how can we as investors understand uh, uh, companies and how good they are? And Paul has really come up upon uh, what I think is a great scorecard. Uh, a way of measuring and a methodology that helps us understand advanced business practice. So he will share that today. Um, also, Paul has a new book coming out. I'm told out today, right? Uh, the Hip idea. Investor. Uh, right. That's a best-selling book, The Hip Investor. I, I launched a book last year called The Unhip Investor, and it did not sell uh, well. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Mark Gunther is also with us. Uh, Mark has been with us before, author, writer. Uh, Mark has uh, written what I think is one of the better books that uh, looks at the intersection of faith and business practice and really gives you a guide in understanding the journey of faith along with the journey of leadership uh, that is part of business. He is a contributing editor to Fortune magazine. He is also the author of four books. Most importantly, this man is a marathon runner. Uh, so you talk about sustainable, where we drive, he runs. So uh, welcome Mark Gunther. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paul. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be here in uh, North Carolina. And uh, this is the beginning uh, of the HIP book tour. So raise your, uh, raise your hand if you end up not being able to hear me. So um, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Al for that generous introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, you can introduce me anytime. That's really fantastic. And uh, Jessica uh, for uh, organizing all of this to come together and the, and the CSC team. So I uh, should give them a round of applause as well. And uh, two of my favorite UNC students, uh, Napoleon Wallace and Lee Coker, uh, are both uh, par uh, MBAs here who are hip in their own right and uh, who are also part of the book. So if you end up reading the book, you'll see Napoleon and, and Lee both, uh, both in there. Napoleon and Lee, it sounds like an old Revolutionary War battle, but <laughs> it actually has positive human impact. So, um, okay, so we're going to talk about global innovations in energy. So my background includes uh, having worked for, uh, early in my career, the McKinsey Energy Practice, uh, where we designed incentive regulation both for companies to help them uh, act in a more customer-friendly way and reward them financially for that, or for state PUCs. Um, I was not involved in the California energy meltdown, so please don't blame me for that. Um, and the, um, uh, my additional energy background is having co-founded the energy practice at CSC Index, which is a, a consulting firm, uh, now part of CSC. And, um, and I drive a 2005 Prius, uh, with, and the brakes work. So, uh, so what I'm talking to you about today uh, is uh, how to be a hip investor and what that means from uh, energy and emissions uh, uh, as well as overall environmental point of view. And also ask you to expand your definition in terms of sustainability, not just to the environment, but also to things like health and wealth and equality and trust. So uh, as was introduced, the book The Hip Investor is out next Monday. If you have a Kindle or Nook or coming soon on the iPad, you can get it today. Uh, or you can place your pre-order. So I've just made my publisher very happy. Um, all right, how much capital operates in the world markets today? There's about $175 trillion of global capital floating around, equity, debt, cash, uh, government funds. Um, so a very large number. Actually, energy companies, public energy companies, represent 5 or 6% of the equity portion of that global market cap. So these are uh, companies that actually drive not only innovation and the fuel of our lives, 
but also drive the capital markets. All right, so if you do like we did for Fast Company Magazine uh, in 2008, a profile on oil, uh, which you can find on, uh, you can link at fastcompany.com, if you add up the top 10 energy companies in US and Europe for their capital spending, it actually adds up to about $139 billion. So this morning we heard that energy spending was about $600 billion. The top 10 oil companies, which include Exxon, Total, and other global leaders, is about $139 billion. To put that in perspective, the total wealth of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Carlos Slim is about $139 billion. And they didn't make their money on energy. So what does that mean? That means, anybody want to guess what percentage of that $139 billion is renewable versus fossil? Any guesses? 20% renewable or 20% fossil? 20% renewable. Okay, any other guesses? 5%, 0%, 2%, 1%, half a percent. Okay, remember, this is forward looking investment. Forward looking, not embedded legacy assets on the balance sheet. Forward looking investment. The answer is less than 5%. It's actually between the 2 and 3% range. Companies like Shell and Chevron are higher. Companies like Exxon are lower, even with their $400 million into algae-based fuels that they remind you about on the Wall Street Journal cover every day. So 95% plus of our future energy spending already allocated in financial statements is going to fossil fuel, natural gas, as well as uh, uh, traditional petroleum sources. So what do we do about that? What do we do about that as investors? So at Hip Investor, what we look at is what's the intersection between doing good, solving a human need, and making money, maximizing profit. And for, if you read about this, most people think of those as separate, but they actually are integrated. And how you can do that is if you solve a human need in health or wealth or earth or equality or trust, you can actually create products, run your business, operate your supply chain like the Walmart Sustainability Index does and make decisions about new products, capital allocation, and performance reviews that actually map directly into the financial statements. So we'll take a quick pop quiz here. Who here has heard a company say, people are our most important asset? Okay, has anybody not heard that? Okay, so I'm gonna take another walk through the audience. Where are people on the balance, where are people on the financial statements? What's that? They're not there? Well, they're there somewhere. Where is accounting for people on the financial statements? SG&A, salaries, cost of goods sold, where else? Benefits, where else? Workers' comp, liabilities, lawsuits, severance, anywhere else? Are they anywhere on the balance sheet besides liabilities? Training, okay, if training gets capitalized, they might be on the balance sheet. Anywhere else. People are our most important asset, but unless you get lucky and you do an acquisition with high talent value and it ends up in goodwill, people are not on the asset side of the balance sheet. So for those of you who are accounting fluent, there's a gap in gap. All right, so who are we? Hip Investor, we're a registered investment advisor, currently registered in California. Uh, we'll soon be registered in additional states. Um, uh, depending on the state, uh, we can tell you about our performance. Uh, we build investment indexes, so I'm going to tell you about the HIP 100 index, which is a substitute for the S&P. We call it the new fundamentals of investing. We also create portfolios for investors and manage their wealth as an investment advisor as well as a portfolio manager. And we advise companies, including uh, we've advised Walmart and Cisco, uh, on how they can be more sustainable from uh, energy and emissions as well as human impact point of view. And we have a group of multidisciplinary uh, staff, and of course, we mentioned the book. Okay, since I'm a regulated financial advisor, I need to show you this. Please memorize it. Most important thing, past performance is not indicative of future results. All right, so McKinsey, I used to work at McKinsey. Uh, I love data, so does uh, uh, people who work in the uh, consulting field. McKinsey did a survey about a year and a half ago of 238 CFOs and investors and 127 leaders in corporate social responsibility. They were asked the question, do environmental and ecological initiatives add shareholder value? And 85% said yes. 85% said yes. 
However, during the financial crisis, half of them said, not now. So when I interviewed a telecom company two weeks ago, since uh, Fast Company is going to excerpt the book for most of May, I said, can you talk about some of your eco initiatives? They said, yes, we're revitalizing the central offices of all the central offices from the old telephone lines, but we had to do something special to get it funded. I said, what? What do you mean? What well, was the payback? It was a two-year payback. I said, oh, it didn't make it through the capital allocation? Well, no. So two-year payback is a 50% internal rate of return. I said, is your cost of capital greater than 50%? They said, no. I said, so if you have a 50% rate of return project, how was it not funded through CapEx? And they said, only projects with 12 months payback are getting funded. This is a Fortune 500 company. So, and for them, they created a special process, a special CapEx process outside the traditional CapEx process to value things that had a carbon value or eco value, which they also consider a brand value. So CSR, or sustainability professionals, half of them in this McKinsey survey said they don't know the shareholder value of what they're doing. This is not a good manager. And 14% of them prioritize charitable giving over revenue growth in terms of the main benefits. This is the mindset that exists today in corporates. So let's go to more data. Two thirds of customers actually want to buy something good. And this includes business customers as well as uh, B2C as well as B2B. And in the consumer market, a third of people will tell a friend. So if you actually have a good product, it can spread. On the investor side, two out of three people actually see doing good as part of their portfolio. But one fifth will not invest if they do good. And the challenge is, if you remember that chart I showed you about doing good versus making money, 11% of the dollars are on doing good, 89% are on making money. What we're trying to do at Hip Investor is to show you that 100% of your dollars can go to doing both. All right, so what does this mean? What are the categories of being hip in where you work, the products you create, how you invest? We came up with five categories inspired by Dr. Maslow, fulfilling human needs, health and wealth, earth and equality, and trust. So we're going to focus on the earth for this session since we're talking about global innovations in energy. Each of these categories actually create products that, uh, that have top line revenue growth, have operating cost reductions, or even, as you know, almost everybody in this room knows, you can collect a check worth 30% of the capital investment in renewable energy from the US Treasury if it can deliver value for five years. So when you do this from a portfolio perspective and you actually overweight companies that are sustainable and providing this value and you underweight companies that are not, these are the same companies in the HIP 100 and the S&P 100 and you can outperform on average by about 4%. And we've been operating the index live since July of last year and that's been the case compared to this back cast. The bottom line there is the Domini 400 social index, a traditional socially responsible investing approach where they kick out negative companies, and they rate policies, not results. We rate results, and we're inclusive. Exxon and Halliburton are included in what we do. So the three core questions uh, to ask are, one, what products are you creating that solve a human need? And this, obviously, energy is essential to everything that we do. The air conditioning in this room, the air that we're uh, breathing that's filtered, how your lunches were cooked, how the uh, iced tea got here from the supplier. Two, how do you design a business that actually integrates this from an operating metrics perspective? And so I'll introduce, we look at things as broad as customer satisfaction, and employee satisfaction, as well as things like board diversity. And then three is, how do you embed this in decisions about every day? All right, so good old McKinsey. I use them a lot because they do really detailed work. You can also find something like this at Climate Works. ClimateWorks is trying to help solve climate change. It's a nonprofit foundation. Uh, has, uh, has about a billion dollars that they're going to deploy on six industries in six countries, of which US and China are two of them. So what this chart shows, it's a little bit of a confusing, because these are profitable initiatives in building efficiency, transportation efficiency, and industrial efficiency. These are all things that have positive net present value today. These are things that will make you money. And they will take energy and carbon out of society. Then, as a group, there are things like renewables, carbon capture and storage, and other innovations, which McKinsey's also made an adjustment at an industry level by saying good policy could drop the cost of those. But what they're saying is, as an industry, it still needs subsidies. 
All right, so this is a macro factor that you should consider in your businesses. But what we found in analyzing 500 companies of all S&P, 500 companies, and we look at the metrics in uh, Earth, greenhouse gas emissions, which if you can't find it on a company website in their annual report, which the SEC is encouraging all companies to do this year, you can find it at the Carbon Disclosure Project, a nonprofit where several financial institutions have actually aligned, including Deutsche Bank and Citigroup and others to communicate their scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. It also describes some of these other things, resource efficiency. So uh, back in the late 80s, a Netherlands professor did a study that showed that of 100% of material that goes into the supply chain, only 6% is estimated to come out the other side. 94% ends up as waste. Now if you look at Procter & Gamble, they actually do this calculation for their company, and it may not be the exact same calculation, they claim it's the opposite. They claim that 94% comes out the other end and only 6% is waste. All right, so there's a big gap in there. You can do your own analysis, but what's important to know is how efficient is your process and your supply chain or your energy input to your energy output. Renewable power, so uh, the EPA actually publishes around this. Anybody know who uses the highest percentage of renewable power in their um, in-house energy? What company? PepsiCo is up there. Was that Lee? Nope, Mark. So uh, Kimberly Clark, 7% comes from biomass. These are the things that you can find out when you actually look at epa.gov. All right, so all of those map in, and so uh, this is one of our analyses where in each of these categories you can see a variety of S&P 500 companies that are leaders in each of these metrics. What you will rarely find is this is a very short list of companies who are leaders across all categories. So part of that is driven by what business they're in, and part of that is driven by how they operate. And what you can see that's common about many of these companies, they're full of engineers. So United Technologies, which runs Otis Elevators, Pratt & Whitney Jet Engines, uh, a very, very hip company in both its management practices as well as the operating metrics. Hewlett Packard, a nine-digit revenue company, more than $100 billion, with business units that are each more than $10 billion. They're dematerializing their company. They're shifting from products to services. So for you in this room, the question is, do you want to sell energy capital equipment or do you want to sell energy services or electricity? Something to consider. DuPont, who's not listed here, has a metric that they call shareholder value per pound of product. Not shareholder value per share or not shareholder value per revenue dollar, shareholder value per pound of product. So people are thinking of how to connect mass, physical mass, with financial value. All right, so uh, these uh, numbers are not up to date. I researched it overnight, so I'm sorry the chart's not uh, exact. So these are prices in four different markets of carbon credits, some of which you may already be using, let's say through a CDM mechanism. Um, company to company trading, uh, since this is a fragmented market, ranges from $5 a ton to $20 a ton. On the Chicago Climate Exchange, what used to be $2, uh, $2 last year is now $0.10 cents today. And Reggie in the Northeast, uh, focusing on the utility industry, um, is down from $3.38 to just over $2. Meanwhile, in Europe, the 10 to 12 euro range is up to 15 to 16 euros. And if you look at this from a profit at risk point of view, so this chart is from the, one of the most profitable years from the oil industry. This is what we did for Fast Company. We said, let's take the greenhouse gases associated with your production, and let's figure out if there were a carbon tax, let's call it 20 bucks, what percent of profit is at risk? Because energy companies, large energy companies, will love to tell you that you're going to put them out of business. And what we found is, in one of the most profitable years in an energy company, no more than 20% of profits were at risk. So yes, a major factor, a material factor, but also not something that's going to put them out of business because energy prices today do not include what we call externalities. They don't include the cost of pollution, they don't include cleaning up after them, they don't include the oil spills that, um, that go on. And so we did, we put together a pocket guide to big oil, uh, and so we did a hip analysis of the top 10 companies, this is where the $139 billion analysis came from before, and we rated those. 
So what's critical today are companies like GE are embedding this in their management systems. So if you're a business unit leader at GE, greenhouse gas reduction in number of tons related to your business is a business metric. You will not get your full bonus unless you reduce greenhouse gases at GE. This is amazing. In addition, they have a sustainability group on the board that Senator Sam Nunn is on. The engineers are a pioneering product um, that add up to about 10% of GE's top line. Eco-imagination has led to healthy imagination, working its way across the hip scale. So companies are acting differently. Chevron has a trading desk uh, in Europe for carbon credits. They also have an energy efficiency unit in China to reduce energy. So forward-looking companies are actually doing this. So when you plot how well a company manages itself against the impact that they actually generate, there's a general upward curve. So in other words, it's kind of you know, follows that if you manage tightly around sustainability, it leads to higher impact. There's still a good and bad performer at each level. This is the S&P 100, the S&P 500. So again, we've taken this to each company within the S&P, and then what we do is, whereas the S&P is market valuated, financial valuated, if, who, believe, who here believes in efficient capital markets? One, two and a half. Who here believes in inefficient capital markets? And the rest of you believe so this is something maybe for our discussion with, uh, with Mark. So what happens is we rebalance existing companies within the S&P, it's not about stock selection in this current version, around sustainability. And when you do that, you find that a company like Exxon, which as part of the S&P is 6.5%, one company, 100 company index, there's one company, it's 1%, right? No, Exxon is more than 6% because of the amount of value that creates. So what we do is we end up squishing that more towards what they're truly producing from a sustainability point of view, which is not a lot. Uh, it's some, but not a lot. Whereas on the upper hand, like Ford, is actually building products that are more energy efficient. They still have products that are non-energy efficient or consume fossil fuels. They put a green roof on the plants in Michigan. They're changing their business practices and will overweight a company like that. They're actually one that didn't need a federal bailout. And you can do this in, uh, by industry as well. So that's where we see, and we've been experiencing an outperformance, not only in return, but also risk. So what's important to note is, no matter what type of investor you are, and you may find some of these investors in your energy ventures, you may find some that are individual investors and pioneers. So the son of Sam Walton at Walmart, Rob Walton, is a $250 million investor in First Solar, public company. Family offices who uh, see that the end of the oil age is over uh, will invest in companies like that. Foundations and endowments, especially in the environment, are not doing that. University endowments are not necessarily according to their mission. Foundations, even like Rockefeller, are not yet according to their mission. Corporate treasuries like Starbucks are actually investing in their supply chain to not only have more organic foods and fair trade farming, and only leading pensions, maybe in California, New York, Minnesota, city of LA, city of New York. So there's a lot of potential for impact investing in the types of things that you do across all asset classes, not only equity, but fixed income, venture capital, and the like. And you know, this is not a recommendation, this is only information. You know, a mutual fund like Portfolio 21, P-O-R-T-X, has been doing this for 10 years. Leslie Christian is a woman mutual fund manager who's been doing that and delivering value around environmental sustainability in public companies globally. And as a quick aside, anybody want to guess, if you're a top quartile company in the S&P, what's the percentage of women are on your board? I'd say there's 10 people on your board. How many women would be on the board if you're a leading company? Two, one, one. Anybody else? Three, it's just over two. The return on equity of top quartile companies with a mere two women on the board versus bottom quartile companies with almost no women on the board, four percentage points of return on equity, nine versus 13%. When it goes up to three, the return on equity jumps to 16%. And when you analyze women hedge fund managers, women hedge fund managers outperform male hedge fund managers on both a 10-year basis as well as a one-year basis through the meltdown. That's why Nicholas Kristof wrote in the New York Times, would Lehman Brothers have crashed if it was called Lehman Sisters? <laughs> 
So what I encourage all of you to do in this room is don't underestimate the talent that comes from all sectors of society. We have a male balance room here. We may not have a appropriately ethnic balance room here. There is talent from all parts of society. So one day I emailed uh, Makani, which has the wind tents up there, because they published the, the 25 people in their Google back company. And there were two women there. One was the receptionist and one was the archivist. A 25 person company has an archivist, crazy. Find the women engineers. You will increase the quality of your engineering when you have a fully diverse uh, talent staff and you'll attract them. Same thing on ethnicity, same thing on ethnic class, same thing on globally. All right, so what is the future of HIP? The future is we're gonna transform $175 trillion of capital markets. It's already happening today with the Carbon Disclosure Project. It's already happening today with the equator principles that favor for fixed income uh, environmental projects that are positive NPV. The World Bank and IFC are doing that. We're creating a competitive race to, top, to the top uh, around this HIP framework, and we're allowing citizens to uh, participate in that communication. So that's the end of my introductory presentation. I thank you for your attention and your participation. You have good quiz answers. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the book and uh, order it for your board or staff or your students or your faculty or your board members. Um, and uh, Mark and I are going to have a deeper conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for having me here. Thank you, Jessica, Paul. Thanks for that presentation. I've got about a hundred questions to okay. cram into twenty minutes, Rapid so fire. so we'll that go fast. That means twelve seconds each. <laughs> so, this idea of doing uh, well by doing good has been around for a long time. We've had the socially responsible mutual funds. Uh, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, the FTSE for Good Index, and then there have been other companies that have come along, like Innovest, said we can rate companies that are sustainable, they're going to perform better than the market. Um, you've tracked this for a year officially, or nine months officially, then you backtracked it for another four or five years. Correct. Um, I don't believe historically, there may be some finance professors in the room who would correct me, but I don't believe historically that any of these other efforts have succeeded in outperforming the market as a whole over time. So first of all, am I right about that? And if I am, what are you doing differently that gives you confidence that you can outperform? Sure. Well, let's give credit where credit is due. Um, I did mention Portfolio 21, um, which again, that's not an investment recommendation. But if you actually look at their both return performance and their risk-adjusted return performance, they generate what financial people call alpha. Um, so they generate return and excess of risk from their methodical look, fundamentally researching a company, mm -hmm. and what their positive potential is. Um, there are others, like Goldman Sachs uh, actually has a unit called Sustain. So if you go to your web browser and you type GS space Sustain, you'll pull up a 2007 report that shows a bottom-up analysis using cash return on cash investment, croaky. Um, and they'll show you for six sectors, I think that's up to 10 now, um, of uh, financial outperformance. Um, now, I can't disclose what the 08, 09, 010 performance is. You need to be a Goldman Sachs client to do that. Um, but not everybody in Goldman Sachs is even aware that that exists. And then, of course, Al Gore and uh, David Blood, who used to work at Goldman Sachs, have a firm called Generation Investment Management, um, also one that offers this type of investing. You need to contact them to see what their performance is. Um, but those are all leaders who are looking at the business performance and how it creates shareholder value. Um, not just the social performance. And so it is the case, if you go to socialfunds.com and you look at the 200 or so funds or ETFs there, that most of those don't deliver the gross return and certainly don't deliver, the majority don't deliver the risk-adjusted return. Right. I mean, I happen to be an investor in Portfolio 21, so I'm happy that they've done well, but I'm not under the illusion that that's because they are factoring in social and environmental criteria. I just think they're a well-managed fund. Hmm. And, and in the social investing world, they will not even claim outperformance. What they will say is you can invest with your values and not suffer a penalty, which by itself is sort of uh, 
you know, contravenes traditional finance where they say if you limit your, your universe of choices, you're going to pay a performance penalty. Yeah, um, and, if you, are, and, if, are you and if you ask David Blood, David Blood starts off the conversation saying this is about performance, period. So it's a different marketing message for a marketing segment, but if you actually look at the numbers for Portfolio 21, it may actually live up to that. Okay. Um, how data-driven is your analysis and how subjective is it? Are these um, numbers you can sort of plug into a, sp a sh spreadsheet and mm -hmm. then rebalance the 100 big companies to become the HIP yep. index, or are there, um, to what degree do judgments come into play? Right. Great question. So first of all, what's the universe? So we pick the same universe as the S&P, so there's no judgment there. We're just taking what S&P says and we're rebalancing it. And then we apply three categories of tests to it. So one is around products, what percentage of your revenue generates a net positive human impact. Unfortunately, there's only about six companies out of the whole S&P that uh, describe that, GE, Pepsi, Campbell Soup, DuPont, Procter & Gamble. Um, so that gets a very low weighting because there's very low data. Um, the second thing we do is we um, look at the operating metrics of the companies. So both what they uh, give publicly in their um, data, and they're a public company. In general, public companies do not lie, um, except for Exxon, usually. <laughs> and a uh, separate story about that later. Um, uh, sorry, they just, they sent an email to me that said they can't do something and then on CNBC they said the exact opposite. It's just not fair. Um, and then on operating metrics, um, we look at company sources, third party sources, government sources, nonprofit sources, um, and the data is out there. It's available for everybody to see. Um, that's what uh, Wharton professor Alex Edmonds did with uh, best companies to work for data and showed that Wall Street analysts are missing uh, the value of great talent and companies who attract great talent um, who outperform by 4%. And then the third, uh, and that's all data, that we don't do any judgment. We break the data into anecdotal versus quantitative. And so in our analysis, a negative quantitative score will get more points than an anecdotal score or no data at all. And so there's a, we're encouraging more transparency. And then the third category is management systems. And so we interview the companies. We send them the five management practices questions that we saw up on the board. Um, there are multiple choices. And so are you a three or a four in that? You know, that there's a little bit of subjectivity, but they're pretty clear. And most companies actually, you know, including, you know, companies like Intel, um, downgrade themselves. They don't overinflate, they underinflate. So it's a, that's probably the most subjective, uh, but it's still criteria driven. But, but did you begin by saying you're analyzing the human impact of the products these companies make that comes into play? That is our uh, goal, yes. So what's your, how do you analyze the impact of, let's say, I'll pick two products, yep. a Pepsi yep. and a nuclear power plant? Okay. So let's start I with mean, the nuclear power plant. are they positive plants. or negative generally? Yeah, so let's start, well, it depends what your goal is and how you weight those criteria. So uh, can we add cigarettes too? I'm sorry to do that. Well, that's an easy sorry one. to do that in Carolina. The, the Pepsi is the harder one, right? No, actually, I think cigarettes is a difficult one um, because this. Like, why do people smoke? Seriously, why do people smoke? Some people smoke to lose weight. Some people smoke for community. Some people smoke to reduce stress. So if you're in charge of strategy at Philip Morris, Sorry, we need to get a mic over there. No, they're addicted, he said. Oh, OK. Yeah. So if you're in charge of strategy at Hint Philip Morris, you would not define, not necessarily choose to define your business as producing more tobacco. You might define it as helping people lose weight and reduce stress and build community, and you would divest those businesses into a different business. All right, so let's dig into, let's do both Pepsi and Coke at the same time, not just to pick on one. Okay. Um, it is the case that it takes more uh, I don't know what product this is. It takes more than this amount of water to make this type of drink. So in the case of Coke, it actually takes two and a half liters to make one liter of Coke, two and a half liters of water to make one liter of Coca-Cola. So that's kind of amazing in itself. And when you interview Coca-Cola about it, or Pepsi about it, um, what they'll say is, we want to be more water efficient in our production. And I say, okay, well, how, how are you more water efficient? Well, we want more water efficient farming of sugar and of corn. And so you say, corn, how is corn in a soft drink? Well, high fructose corn syrup is in a soft drink. And so 
Finally, uh, if you drink a Coca-Cola in the U.S., it is the only country uh, in the world where you're drinking high fructose corn syrup instead of cane sugar or refined cane sugar. And if, even if you go to Mexico or Canada, you'll get real sugar. Um, so that, and, and so if you listen to Michael Pollan, that but says... But that's the environmental impact of the product, right? So what is the, right, so then what they're not saying, and you can't get them to say this very easily, Pepsi at least has this thing called the smart spot, so they have nutritionists rating their food, um, and you get a little smart spot or not, and there's big controversy because obviously the company scientists are different than the government scientists on whether that's nutritious or not. So to shortcut your question, we have not dug deeply into this. A source that we're very much um, think can be a good source going forward is a company called goodguide.com. So what Good Guide does is take the ingredients on a nutrition label, do environmental analysis on those ingredients, uh, including health analysis, and um, do social analysis on the company from a source that they use. And then they, you get a score. And so theoretically, if you had a product portfolio of different products listed on goodguide.com, and you knew the revenue share of each of those, you could do a weighted average of your good score, uh, including the health impacts. And what about nuclear power? All right, so this is a good one. And uh, I've become more of an independent on nuclear power than I used to be. Um, and I worked in the energy practice at McKinsey, and I've worked on the Hanford nuclear site in southeast Washington. So if you turn off the lights, I might actually glow. Um, so nuclear power produces energy with um, uh, basically Incremental nuclear energy produces uh, uh, energy with almost no carbon. There's carbon built into the concrete walls that have to go into the factory. There's carbon associated with the construction. There's a little bit of carbon associated with the delivery and refining, but it's very low carbon. Now, the byproduct of nuclear energy is uh, various forms of uranium or, uh, if you're lucky, plutonium that have 18,000 year half-lives. Um, you know, or cesium, which has a you know, couple thousand year half-life. So that is a major negative. So how you rate those depends on your time frame. And if your time frame is the next five years, then you might not count the uh, toxic byproduct. But uh, that, that doesn't sound very smart. So, um, so on average, nuclear power companies' uh, utilities get a slightly higher rating in our index because they don't contribute much to carbon. And we have another rating, which is much lower than the carbon, because we think the carbon's a much more pressing issue than the half-life at this point. Um, and so they get a slightly better benefit. I guess the reason I'm asking the question is to try to at least suggests that invariably there's a lot of human judgments that go into this kind of an index. In other words, you've made a judgment about nuclear power that we would have. differ from the Sierra Club's judgment, and therefore your index is different than an index they would create of environmentally friendly companies. Absolutely true. There is no answer that's going to be 100% scientifically comprehensive. But there can be answers that are uh, 20, 50, even 80% comprehensive, either from a total cost of ownership, a life cycle analysis, um, or what we like to consider our pragmatic approach. So we are not the purest approach. And this is actually happening in nonprofit um, now, Mark, that you, I think you've written about. Um, so Environmental Defense Fund is actually working with Colbert Carvis Roberts, KKR, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in finance, you dream of working at KKR or at Carlisle Group. They just started working with Carlisle Group. So EDF.org is working with KKR and Carlisle, masters of the universe, to reduce their environmental footprint and carbon intensity. Uh, so for example, in KKR, they're working with Sealy mattresses. So they're reconstituting the product of Sealy mattresses, how they get delivered, how they cube out in the truck in the back, and they're coming up with a cookbook. And so at the end of this process of going through some of their portfolio companies, the commitment is to open source the cookbook. They're not going to do it until they roll it through their portfolio companies. Um, and uh, EDF is doing this out of its current funding. They're not um, taking a percentage of the upside, which is what I would negotiate for. Um, and, um, and now they're starting that process with Carlisle, uh, you know, very conservative investment, global management group, lots of different pools of capital. So I think the challenge for us today is how to be pragmatic, uh, not only purist, but to be pragmatic, and how to generate positive, as, as fast positive progress as possible. And that includes subjective judgments, and so not everybody will select into that. But I think we're going to get more competition. So for example, in the HIP index, the top 10 companies are calling us, asking us how they can be number one. Now, you might not have heard of HIP before you came in this room, but Fortune 500 companies are calling us because we published this in Fast Company, and now we have the book coming out. And companies on the bottom want to get off the bottom. They won't want to be last on the list, even Philip Morris. So this whole curve is going to move up over time, and that's the benefit of a rating system. Okay, great. 
I have a bunch more questions, but why don't we take a question or two from here and then I'll go back to mine. Please. So what, what motivates change? So the, quest, the question is what motivates change? Um, companies are made up of people. People want to feel great about where they work. Gallup has done a cumulative study of more than a million people that has found that 80% of people don't feel pride in using their, uh, don't feel like they're using their best skills at work every day. So when you work for a company that ends up on a list, near the bottom of the list, this even happens in law firms, law students go out and they rate companies on their partner diversity, and then uh, some of those get published like in a law journal, and you will not find that law, typically you will not find that law firm on the bottom of that list again. They'll move up and somebody else will move down. So what motivates change is people's pride in what they do. Nine out of 10 graduates today actually want to work for a company that has deep purpose. And if you believe a Stanford MBA survey from a couple years ago, uh, a couple years ago, at least they were working to work for ten to $15,000 less. So they were willing to make a trade-off to work for a company with purpose. I think given the meltdown today, there's, that number has increased. So what I didn't show you was a chart that shows three out of four people want some form of social values or improvement in social mission where they work. They don't want to do it after work in charity. They actually want to do it in how they work. So somebody like um, Sue Amar at Salesforce.com at a company meeting like this with Mark Benioff at the front stands up at a company meeting of 4,000 people and says, what are we doing for the earth? And Mark Benioff didn't have an answer, just like Jeff Immelt didn't have an answer, which you can read about in the book. And he said, okay, you're in charge. Go uh, figure out what we should be doing for the environment. So people are really motivated by wanting to feel more integrated with society and to do a good job at work. And they consider that doing a good job. And leading companies like General Electric and United Technologies and Intel actually end up building it into their management systems. Speaking of General Electric, I mean, no company has been noisier about the environment and now about health issues. And again, we don't want to argue by anecdote here, but haven't they substantially underperformed the um, S&P 500 for close to a decade now? Uh, they, they have, and that has dragged down our performance. Okay. And another question, and then I'll take one from out here. Um, and I know you're not claiming to be you know, all knowing here. And I guess I should <laughs> preface this by saying I fundamentally completely agree with what you're trying to do, but okay. I'm just challenging how you're trying to do it. At friction would, comes from diamond, you know, diamonds. Would your index friction. in any way have identified the issues that, you know, um, cause the stock prices of companies like, uh, you know, Citigroup, Countrywide, Bank of America, that whole collection of firms to pretty much collapse in 2008? Yep. yep. Um, so I think there's two aspects to your question. Um, would we have, would our score have predicted somebody who crashed? Not necessarily. So we interviewed Wachovia two weeks before the meltdown, and Wachovia said, we're taking Community Reinvestment Act, which mandates that you serve multi-income groups, and we're actually making that our business strategy. We are embracing subprime as a business opportunity to create wealth in those communities. So if you listen to that, that sounds pretty good. They filed for bankruptcy two weeks later, so there was a disconnect between what they were saying and what they were really doing. Um, on the other hand, you know, Goldman Sachs was well, sued actually, by the- Actually, Paul, Paul, is it really a disconnect? Weren't the companies that said, we want to make home ownership the American dream for everyone um, pursuing a much riskier path than those that didn't claim a kind of social you know, purpose to what they were doing this in is making a, mortgages. This is a good point. I don't it's think it's also, a disconnect so much as a, uh, a tension between the social goal and the financial goal. Well, I think it comes down to execution. So like Discover Card now, if anybody has a Discover account, when you go there, it will be trying to help you do financial analysis and projections of your cash flow, just like Mint.com does, hmm. um, which tends to be used by people who um, are more comfortable giving their financial passwords to a third party. and that type of interactive tool with the customer creating financial literacy, which is very low in this country, um, is more towards implementation. What Wachovia was talking about, or Wells Fargo was doing in making easy credit for big screen TVs, <clears throat> um, wasn't interviewing the customer about their, if this was a good trade-off for their quality of life. And now you could say, well, why should the company uh, judge that? And so that has to get figured out. It's not clear. But what is clear is they were judging the repayment risk 
not the, they're, they're judging the risk, repayment risk, they weren't judging the impact opportunity and whether those were appropriate. And so, same thing, I'm, you could ask this about government policy. Is it right to have a 100% home ownership goal for government policy? And until we fix financial literacy, income generation, income disparities, then you have this social goal that will put the people on the fringe at risk. So that's, I mean, it is a challenge. What I think the HIP framework does point to is if you're transparent about how you operate and the net impact of your products and how you actually manage, so if you go to Alcoa, a mining and metals company, you go to alcoa.com slash sustainability, they disclose not only the 12 metrics that they're using, of which two or three are financial, and the rest are environmental, uh, people, and community. They will also say, here's our decision-making process for our capital allocation. And step one is the project definition. And step two is, eight, their words, triple bottom line analysis. Go there, alcoa.com slash sustainability. It's amazing. This is a Fortune 100 company in a very dirty industry. And so Goldman Sachs doesn't do that. They're not very transparent. So my wife said, I don't think Goldman Sachs would be getting sued for fraud if they were hip. So, um, you know, so that's an anecdote, and she's my wife, but she's also my, oh, so <laughs> she's also my soulmate, so I'm going to listen to her. Oh, so they were penalized for their lack of transparency, transparency. in your index. Uh, there are elements of Goldman Sachs that are penalized for transparency, and there are elements of all companies that are penalized for, transparent, for, for lack, lack of, of for being opaque. Yeah. Let's take another question or two from out here. No questions? Gosh, with all these students wow. and professors, I'm shocked. We got good questions in the Capital Markets <laughs> Lab yesterday. We went straight into the heart of the trading right, desk. There's one. Why don't you identify yourself, too, if you don't mind? Great question, thanks Matt. Um, so there are five elements of management systems that we look at. Um, one is vision. Does the business vision and the sustainability vision, are they the same thing and on the same timeline? Um, and for companies like Interface that say, that know that their business strategy is to actually do this and it pulled them through an industry meltdown in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, um, uh, so that's one. So they, they want to be carbon neutral, environmentally neutral by 2020, and restorative, as Paul Hawken talks about it, by 2021. Um, P&G and DuPont have similar type goals. Um, the second is metrics. Are there actual environmental or social or human metrics at the balance scorecard level at the top of the company that cascade all the way down? Yes or no, that's a scale of one to five. Three is, do those metrics link directly to financial value? This is the most important thing that the social investors have not gotten yet, is this distinction between results that drive shareholder value and policy that is good. And um, so do they drive top line revenue, bottom line cost reduction, do you get your 30% check from the US Treasury? The fourth category is accountability. So how high and how far reaching across the company? Board of directors, is this a real thing at the board of directors or do people show up once a year to collect kudos from the board? Do frontline employees actually use this in day-to-day -day decision making? Do middle managers making capital allocation in their business unit uh, use sustainability criteria like Alcoa describes? Um, and then fifth is, uh, I I'm sorry, I combined four and five, accountability and decision making. So those are the five that we look at. We do have another five questions that get a little bit deeper into what you're saying about talent development and training and legal risks. Uh, we haven't done that analysis for the full set of companies. It was part of our original concept list that we pared down to make it um, implementable for companies. And this is a key point. Um, somebody like the GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, has this Encyclopedia Britannica of 200 metrics that you need to fill out to get the top score. And I've worked for boards of directors and inside Fortune 500 companies. I've, this is my second company that I'm running. Managers can't handle more than about five metrics. And that's not bad, it's just human. It's just human. 
And so it's your job as an executive or a board member in your company to figure out what are the core five. Financial is one or maybe two of them, but they're not all of them. Talent is one. Ecological environment is one. There's probably some others that uniquely drive your business strategy. And there's trade-offs between them that you may need to make. But you can pick ones that drive both positive impact and positive profit at the same time. And this whole mindset of if it says social or environmental, then it can't make more money, it's wrong. It may not have ever been true. Um, so and that's what we're discovering with the hip investor is um, when you do this, on average, not for everything, but when you create a diversified portfolio, you can not only make money, you can make more money and typically do it at uh, a same or lower risk. Okay. Take one from the middle. Yep. Yeah, great question. Great question. So lobbying strategy dollars and other operating practices. So this is a good one. Mark, you can get me on this one. Um, so opensecrets.org is a public database run by a nonprofit that collects Federal Election Commission data, FEC data, that you could get on your own, but it's not very searchable. Um, they actually parse it out by company and by executive. Um, and they look at it by year, and you can see it go up and down in election years. And they started to do it by issue around the PACs, Associated uh, Political Action Committees. So we look at, as part of our trust category, Health, Wealth, Earth Equality Trust, we look at that data and look at it as a percentage of revenue. And what you find is in telecom, it's a very high number. AT&T spends tens of millions of dollars a year. Sprint and Verizon do it as well. Um, and somebody like Halliburton uh, in 2000 to 2008 spent almost nothing. Now, if you look just at the data, you would say Halliburton gets a decent score because a low percentage of the revenue, but you haven't accounted for the fact that the vice president used to work there. So this is, you know, we, so did, we did not change that, but that's something that you could change if you thought that was a significant factor. So, you, but your judgment is a company that is spending a lot of money on lobbying. The metric may have is some liabilities of some kind. The metric is dollars, but another metric that is impossible to do would be time or influence. And so that's why I say we don't have a hundred percent metric system. Um, we have what we think end up being leading indicators, but, uh, but it's but, not a complete indicator. But again, the the that you're translating a lot of money spent on lobbying, that's, that's a penalty for a company. Yes. And, and what, if, what if, again, it's GE and DuPont and Duke Energy lobbying for climate change legislation? They get penalized for that? Currently, they get penalized for that. In a future version of HIP, we would actually parse out award that. what is contributing to human impact and what is not. Or eBay likes to say they go after lower taxes for small and medium entrepreneurs. And there's a 750,000 people who make their primary living on eBay, so less taxes for them should be good, right? But if they don't pay their taxes, then how are they going to pay for the services? So this is, you know, Walmart, this is another good one. Low, low prices at Walmart translate into lower costs, which um, translate into high imports from China, which has created the largest middle class in a decade in history of 400 million people which has allowed <clears throat> uh, China's reserves to finance our low-cost debt. <laughs> you know, just this is the type of thinking that we don't do on a daily basis and that we're trying to encourage. Um, and Al Gore wrote about this in Age of Reason. It's what's the full life cycle and ripple effects of our decisions. And the more we do that, and everybody in this room, you know, has an engineering mindset of some sort, the more we do that and the more we help others understand that, the more complete and sound and risk-efficient uh, decisions we can make. So we're, we're running a little short on time, I think. Why don't I just ask you, and, and if I don't expect you to have the entire index in your head, but I'm just curious, mentioning, I'd like to mention a few companies and tell yep. me if they're either overweighted in the HIP index, okay. meaning you like them, or underweighted in the HIP index, meaning, I don't mean you personally, but the index doesn't like them. Well, well let's just talk about overweight, underweight, okay. but, uh, and I'll do my best. But. So Walmart. 
Walmart is underweighted for two reasons. One, um, there's not 100% complete data on what they do. Two, they've made a lot of environmental progress, but not as much social progress. And three, just a mechanic of the index is they're uh, a nine-digit uh, market cap company. And um, right now, our index is biased against those supersized companies. Oh, OK. And when you say social product, you're, uh, social progress, you're talking about labor relations or? It includes that. The Walmart Sustainability Index, which we were part of a group of a dozen people that uh, designed in 2008, including Blue Sky and EDF and WRI and suppliers and staff um, and universities of Arizona and Arkansas, um, three out of the four categories of the Walmart Index, which you might take as a supplier, are environmental, and one is social, which is mainly around transparency and trust and some labor relations. And Walmart has gone on the record, both here and in China, saying you need to follow the laws on the books. Um, so how they measure that isn't as complete. Um, and there's some, you know, you compare Walmart to Costco or Target. Uh, employees at Costco or Target make relatively more. Um, and, and is have that better a good healthcare. or a bad thing? Uh, employees making more money is a good thing. Employees having access to health care is a good thing. But employees making more money is a good thing, but that means customers are paying more, right? So how do you factor in the fact that uh, you know, we heard half the people, or maybe it was a third of the people in North Carolina make $30,000 a year. Um, isn't Walmart delivering tremendous value to that segment of the customer? They are, and to the extent we get better price comparison data, uh, which we tried to do in this oil company analysis for Valero. So when Valero Energy goes into a market, they typically undercut BP and Shell, and so they bring the cost down for customers. But uh, there's not a great data source for that mark in terms of the price data. So that's that's you know that's something we want to add into a future version. But yes, that conceptually we agree. Practically, we don't have a good data source yet. How about Google? Google is underweighted, and not only because they're big, uh, because but they're not the evil. <laughs> they're good. Well, <laughs> they are also opaque. So how do we know? You mean they're not transparent about what they're doing? They are not transparent about what they're doing. So even they'll talk about stories of what they're doing on the eco efficiency side, but they don't tell you how much they're spending. They um, to date have not, uh, as far as we know, filled out a carbon disclosure project report, which many of its peers have, IBM, Cisco, HP, Intel. Okay. So if you're not transparent, uh, the index is biased against you. Okay. Um, is there a utility company that pops and does very well in the index? Right. So as I mentioned before, actually utilities end up doing okay. Um, uh, depending on their carbon intensity. Um, you know, PG&E pops, actually. And this is another weird one, like GE. There's, you know, a long history of uh, friction, um, you know, in their past sort of legacy issues. Again, we're looking on a forward-looking basis, like finance. Finance is a forward, capital markets is a forward-looking basis. PG&E pops for a couple of reasons. One, um, they are heavy nuclear, but they're also heavy renewable energy. Um, they have a balanced scorecard of 10 different metrics, part of the regulatory framework around customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, greenhouse gas intensity, diversity of staff, and other issues. Um, and they actually live it. I mean, obviously, it's a big company, so it's not perfect. But on average, it tends to be a, it, it's a better than average utility in the HIP index. Great. Well, I am uh, sorry to say we're out of time. I want to say thank you for both being here. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks. I'm certainly rooting for you to succeed and Thanks. figure all these complicated uh, questions out. And please join me in, in thanking Paul for coming. <laughs>